In today's message, Gifts from God, Dr. McLuhan teaches how to live a life that is pleasing to God. The Apostle Paul begins chapter 4 of Ephesians with an invitation to walk in a manner that is worthy with the Lord. He ends the chapter by appealing to us to be kind to one another, tender-hearted towards God and the Spirit working in our lives. In between these two verses, this section is loaded with teaching about how to build a spirit-filled congregation. The book of Ephesians is all about building a strong church. So how do we walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord or worthy of the name of Jesus? He says in verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What beautiful words these are, and what a beautiful thing it is when people in a congregation are able to walk in humility towards one another and love each other like this verse says to us to do. This is the way Jesus lived. It's the way he wants his followers to live. It's a beautiful thing to see people living with respect for one another being eager to maintain the unity of this congregation in the bond of peace, it's a precious thing. Now, Satan has done his best to divide the body of Christ, especially over COVID. And he uses every trick in the book to weaken churches over non-essential arguments. How many of you felt really strongly about an issue, and then six months later you said, you know, what was that all about? It really didn't matter. Most church arguments are over the most trivial and smallest things. It's Satan trying to divide us. Now, Jesus gave up his rights to pay for our sin to be forgiven. He was willing to be offended for a greater cause to bring you and I into the kingdom of God. And so Paul stresses that unity amongst the followers of Jesus begins with the expression nature of God, the unity that we find in God. And so in verses 4 through 6, we read there's one spirit, one Lord, that is Jesus, and one God, and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6. There's beautiful unity in the Godhead, in the nature of God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and God. God the Father coexisted before eternity in perfect love and in harmony. I know this is a difficult concept for many to grasp. But without violating his oneness, Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father created from eternity past all that exists today. This is the greatest expression of unity the world has ever seen. It's God's greatest gift to humanity Now Paul is ready to teach us more about God's gift to humanity. In verses 7 through 14, we learn about the gifts that Jesus gave to the church to help every one of his followers become just like him. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, we're going to be invited to imitate Jesus, to imitate Paul, who is imitating Jesus. So first Paul writes about the gift that is given to every believer, grace, was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7. The gift, of course, is the gift of Jesus on the cross. The measure to which he went is the measure to which God wants to express his love to you and to me. Now, Paul will say much more about spiritual gifts when he writes letters to the Romans and to the Corinthians. But this first gift is the gift of salvation. Now, quoting from Psalm 68, Paul says, Christ also descended to our lowly world. The same one who ascended is the one who descended is the one who ascended higher into all the heavens that he might fill the entire universe with himself. This is from the New Living Translation, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. What a tremendous statement. And so this uh, coming down, see, he couldn't have come up go up if he hadn't come down. And just the simplest way to understand this verse is that Jesus came down from heaven because he preexisted his birth. 
He was with God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, from eternity past, and Christ was present at creation. Paul would write to the Colossians, Jesus didn't come on the scene late in life. He was there in heaven and came down. Now the one who was going up is the one who first came down. So Jesus was with God before he was born in human form in Bethlehem. Jesus emptied himself of the glory he had with the Father in heaven to come to earth in the form of a baby. It was uh, at the moment of his conception, he was fully God and fully human. But he temporarily took off the veil of his glory to take on the fragility, fragility uh, of humanity. He defeated Satan on the cross and ascended back to heaven, taking with him everyone who he set free from sin. This is the simplest understanding of these verses that seem complex at our first reading. The next gift that Jesus gave to the church or apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. Now we know the gifts of the Spirit in Corinthians and Romans are referred to as the charis gifts, charismatic or charis, uh, the charisma is the gift of God, but these are not charis gifts, these are doma gifts, they are gifts of office. The five doma or domain or office gifts are the gifts that establish the great moves of God on the earth. Uh, this has come to be known as the fivefold ministry, referring to the offices that Paul has just referred to. The initial apostles were succeeded by the next generation of fivefold ministers. We ask, well, what is that? If you're not familiar with that word, well, I'll speak about it just a moment. Did you know the word apostle is used over 70 times in the New Testament about many people who are not a part of the original 12? Uh, so an apostle is a pioneer, whether it's taking the gospel to a place where it's never been taken before or whether it's releasing a new idea or dimension to help churches grow. Sometimes apostles we think of as, as uh, culture shapers or nation shapers. But really, apostle at the heart is a father. He's the father of a movement. Many people refer to me as their father overseas and refer to me as their apostle. I'm not ever comfortable with that, but that was what people call me. Now, prophets release to us the word of God. And you may uh, have been greatly helped by this distinction between prophets in the Old Testament and prophets in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the prophet was judged and stoned for a false prophecy. In the New Testament, we don't judge the prophet, we judge the word, because we have the Spirit of God living in us, and a good prophet can give a word that's not relevant to us, and we simply say, I don't think that word applies to me. So we judge the prophecy. In fact, Paul wrote to the Philippians, uh, the Thessalonians sayings, every word needs to be judged to know if it's from a word from the Lord. So prophets are present with us, amazed at the number of people who speak, have spoken into my life prophetically. I copy these words down, I listen to them. Just recently I ran across a 10-minute prophecy that was given to Pastor Margaret and I about three or four years ago. What a wonderful thing to hear. And God speaking into our lives about things we didn't know were in the future. Evangelists are gifted people and helping uh, people come to know Jesus like, uh, uh, like uh, Billy Graham and now his son Franklin Graham who spoke in our town this weekend. What a great joy. All of us, of course, have the opportunity to lead people to Jesus. Some people are just much better at it than others and God gives them a larger platform. These are called offices. And as your pastor and teacher, I occupy the office of pastor teacher. Now there are tons of pastors in every congregation who don't occupy the office or the position, but who do the ministry of a pastor. And this is what I like to tell people when I ask them who your pastor is. I say, well, who's the first person you call when you get in trouble, when you have a medical need, when you have a crisis? And you know, it's not normally me. You call somebody else with whom you have a close relationship. Before you call the pastor, some people go, well, I don't want to bother the pastor. Whoever the first person you call is, that's your pastor. Now, I'm the pastor teacher uh, on Sunday morning, encouraging you from week to week and rooting for you in every way that I can. So 
In our church, you know me simply as pastor or teacher, but in the network, our ministers refer to me as apostle. Some places I'm called a prophet, especially Bangladesh. Some places I'm referred to as an evangelist. Not too long ago, a prophet said, I see your evangelistic gift growing, and I think that's self-evident, isn't it? By the number of people who every week write to us wanting to know, how do I become a follower of Jesus? And so what is the responsibility of these ministers? It is to equip God's people to do his work, build up the church, the body of Christ, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. It is not my job to do your job. It's not your job to do my job. It's my job to help you do your job, what God has called each of us to do. Who are the ministers of the congregation? Every single person sitting in the room is a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I happen to occupy the role of of pastor teacher. I've done it against my will, but God has made it clear that it is his will for me. And so now I've come to have joy in the task that he has given me to do. What has God called you to do? Each of us have a calling And as we follow that calling, we find delight that we never imagined we could experience. So Paul said that the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers are to help the followers of Jesus, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, reach the full measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, so when does the job of the apostles end? Well, not in A.D. 70, not when the Bible was written, when all of us reach the fullness of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastor teachers will be with us until Jesus comes back. They won't have any office in heaven. You don't need a healing gift in heaven. (laughs) You don't need apostles in heaven, but we need them now, fathers, to help us through the course of life. What a blessing it is. So this means that the work of the fivefold ministers will not be complete until everyone comes into the fullness that is found in Jesus. I cannot rest until you believe that you can heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out demons. And I don't mean believe you can until you do. Uh, sometimes people get something and they say, well, we need the pastor. You, you don't need me. You need you. You need the Holy Spirit in you. And week by week, I, as we release words of healing through the congregation, we're wanting you to catch that vision that the Spirit of God can tell you things about people. And you'll take a risk and say, do you by any chance have shoulder pain? You know, I'm, I have a pain right here in the shoulder right now. I don't normally have that pain where it is right now. So somebody has a shoulder pain right now. Just speak to your shoulder pain. Go right now in Jesus' name. So sometimes if you get a pain that you don't normally have, it's the way of God telling you. It's God's way of telling you. You're going to meet somebody who has that pain. It may or may not be obvious, but if you just take a risk, and uh, you don't need to worry about being embarrassed. Say, hey, do you by any chance have a shoulder pain, a pain in your right shoulder? And they'll go, no, I don't. I said, well, I'm sorry. Sometimes I get it wrong. (laughs) It's just a simple way. But more often than not, people say, what are you, a psychic or something? How do you know that? And you just say, well, I think God told me. And uh, if you let me pray, maybe you'll be healed. Very simple ways of moving in these gifts and moving forward. Your pastor is rooting for you and waiting to hear the stories that you will tell as we gather from week to week. Now, one of the gifts that has been given to everyone is the ability to speak the truth in love We are to grow up in every way into him who was the head, who is Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. This is one of the most uh, abused verses in the Bible. Uh, People say, let me just tell you the truth. I want to speak the truth to you in love, brother. I want to speak the truth to you in love, sister. That is a complete misunderstanding because people sometimes think speaking the truth in love is permission to tell people what you think of them and what you don't like about them. And plenty of people have tried to give me their opinion about my shortfalls or my mistakes. And the last time somebody did exactly that, said, I'm going to speak the truth to you in love, and then went off on me. And when it was over, I simply said to him, I hear the voice of Jesus. And when Jesus talks to me, he never talks to me the way you just spoke to me. I encourage you to use that and to protect your spirit because people like to put people down. When Jesus speaks the truth in love, he does not focus on what is wrong. 
He calls you to a higher experience in the spirit. He sees who you are. He sees who, what you will be. He doesn't see what's wrong. When I said sees who you are, I mean your identity. That's what he sees. And we're living below our identity. We are living below our inheritance. And, and when we speak the truth and love to people, we lift them to who God has called them to be. A man walked into a meeting and said, uh, a visitor came into a meeting and, and the pastor said, somebody just walked in who's going to be a great minister. Somebody came up to him afterwards and said, I know that man, he's on drugs. And the prophet said, I knew that. I didn't call him to drugs. I called him to who God see. He was immediately set free from drugs. Isn't that a great story? He did become a great minister of the gospel. See in people what Jesus sees in them. Don't see the mess. See the potential. See what God has for people. So speaking the truth and love calls people into who Jesus made them to be. Paul says, when each one is working properly, when each part is working properly, the body grows so that it builds itself up in love. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 or 17. It's a beautiful thing to see churches function the way God intended for them to function. Ingleside is functioning at a higher level than I've known you over many years. I'm so grateful. Unity is the one thing that the devil constantly tries to disrupt. He's constantly luring people to return to the paths we used to walk in before we knew Jesus. This is I say now, I, now I say this and testify in the Lord that we must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. And so in verses 17 through 32, Paul contrasts the path of Satan and the path of Jesus. Remember, he began by saying, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord who has called you. And so we want to walk in a manner that's worthy of our Savior. So there are things that we need to stop doing and things that we need to start doing by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. For Paul, it was like taking off an old garment, an old dirty garment, and putting on something new and clean. Isn't it wonderful when we get something new and wear it for the first time? There's just that feeling of being refreshed and new. Uh, so here are the main things that Paul says we need to pay attention. We need to put off some things. We need to put off lying, lying to others, and lying to ourselves. And we need to put on the truth, the truth of who God called us to be. Not the truth of how bad we are, but the truth of who God sees us to be and that God is encouraging us. We need to put off uncontrolled temper and replace that with controlled temper. Uh, I use that word carefully because anger is intended by God to be used positively, not because you're explosive, but because you're provoked in your spirit to do something about what is wrong. Um, he will say later, be angry, but do not sin. That means that we are need, we're usually angry about the wrong things and not sufficiently angry about the things that disturb and move the heart of God. So put off stealing and put on good work. Put off degrading talk and put on uplifting talk that our speech would be seasoned with grace that it may bring a blessing to everyone who hears us. We are to put off bitterness and take on the kindness that is Jesus, his kindness towards us. May God help us as we work through these things in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, and that uh, 14, 17 through 32. And Paul says that returning to the old ways uh, and behaving in those ways puts us at tremendous risk as followers of Jesus. I want you to listen carefully to your pastor as I teach you this verse. Give no opportunity to the devil, Ephesians chapter 2, 4, and verse 27 from the ESV. I also want you to hear this verse from the NIV, which helps us just a little bit more. Do not give the devil a foothold, the New International Version. So this translation, I want to draw your attention to the word, um, the word a foothold or opportunity. The Greek behind that is topos. It's the Greek root word for topography 
or real estate. And Paul is saying to us, do not give the devil real estate. Or that is, do not give the devil a place to step on your neck. And all these things that we are to put off gives the devil an opportunity to step on us and to begin to controlling our minds in ways that are not helpful. Uh, stop worrying about whether believers can have a demon or can't have a demon. Just stop giving the devil a foothold. And you'll find out if you give him a foothold, you'll get more than you bargain for. How many are familiar with that expression? If we give an, somebody an inch, they'll take a mile. And if you give the devil a foothold, he'll take a mile out of your spiritual journey. And you will manifest a demon. Uh, whether you're saved or not saved, you can manifest a demon if you give the devil a foothold. And he begins to wreck in your life. By the grace of God, we can cast it out and be set free. <laughs> we just cast out anger, stealing, cheating, lying. Go now. Spirit behind that, go in Jesus' name. And so we, Paul concludes this section, this letter, by saying, Do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What a wonderful verse. When we were studying in Ephesians chapter 1, we learned that the Holy Spirit is the down payment from God, that more is coming. Here in chapter 4, we learn that we are sealed by God until the day of redemption. That Holy Spirit's going to make sure you and I get all the way to the finish line when Jesus comes. But what we want to notice is that we can cause the Holy Spirit to grieve. You don't want the Holy Spirit to grieve over you. There are plenty of stories in the Bible over whom the Spirit of God left because of grief and because of behavior. The Spirit grieves when we behave in devilish ways, when we walk and talk with people in ways that are not pleasing to God. So Paul says we are to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. What wonderful verses these are. May God help you. If there's somebody that you haven't forgiven, would you just forgive them right now? Just say it right where you are in your heart. Just say, I forgive you. It doesn't mean you feel like you wanted to. Doesn't, you have to have any feelings to forgive somebody. Just say it in your heart. I forgive you. I put you in the hands of God. He knows what to do with you. I'm too mad to even know what to do with you. Just forgive right now from your heart and you will be set free. Now I pray as you've listened to this message today, you've, God's opened your eyes to see how much God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. Thank him for dying for you so you can personally experience God's love and power and presence in your life. Write to me and tell me what God has done for you. Bless you with this message today. Jesus, thank you for giving us gifts in the body of Christ that we can use to encourage one another. Help us to treasure and preserve the unity that you bought for us on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk with someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as $1 a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations to Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.